Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. And I'm pleased again to welcome someone who's been researching infection and immunity for 50 years. The University of Melbourne's Peter Doherty, of course, shared the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1996. He's the patron and namesake of the Doherty Institute, which is at the forefront of research into COVID-19. Peter, hello again. Uh, good to see you, Paul. Now, there have been some positive signs in the slowing rate of cases. Is there any way of knowing whether this is just a temporary lull? We're all waiting to see. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, if, uh, if what's happening is uh, maintained, it means we've really slowed community transmission. It looks uh, very promising at the moment, and we're very pleased. The big question is going to be for us how we get out of it. And uh, um, that, uh, that, that's going to be a big policy issue, I think. Um, mm. but, you know, we're lucky that our, our government, our prime minister, his premiers are all acting on medical advice and, and the best epidemiology advice because the epidemiologists are important here. Now, last time we spoke, um, uh, we touched on an immunity passport uh, relating to the exit strategy. How do you think an immunity passport should work? Firstly, we have to have a robust antibody test that tells people, and it has to be one we can use for very broad screening and, and be done pretty rapidly. You know, the sort of antibody tests that are working at the moment are the sort of tests where you stick a needle in someone's arm and take blood. So it's pretty difficult to do that on a big scale. You could do it, but it would take an enormous effort. So what we need is a pinprick drop of blood test. So those tests are being worked up. They're being talked about as point of care tests for doctors and people in the hospitals when someone's first brought in. But they're not just point of care. They could be used as screening tests. Now, a lot of those tests are already coming on uh, on the market, uh, particularly in, in China. Um, and one of the things that the labs are doing, like our lab, is to uh, see whether they're any good. And some of them aren't. Um, they're probably testing for the wrong class of antibody, which is what we call IgM, which tends to be an early response. And we need to test for another, a couple of the other classes, IgG and IgA. Now, there's some hope that some of the tests are good, including a European one. And I, I read uh, over the weekend that the Germans are, are embarking on a 100,000-person uh, uh, screening test. They've had quite a lot of infection in the community. They've been testing a lot. So that will be very interesting to see whether they can get good, good robust data out of that. And then the question is, of course, whether if those um, antibody tests hold up, uh, we expect those people will be protected, but there'll be a bit of testing there as well. So, so given all that, given if we had a good screening antibody test and we had a lot of infection in the community, which we don't at the moment, uh, then we could uh, potentially test and give people uh, an immunology certificate or a passport or something that would say, yes, I've had the infection, I'm safe, I'm not going to infect you and I'm not going to be infected myself. And those people could, rather than snap back into the workforce, as the Prime Minister is saying, they could possibly trickle back. But you have to be careful with this because there are some policy issues. I mean, would it mean that people would take more risks just to get infected so they can get back to their normal life. That's one problem. And I think you would only see that sort of thing introduced once you'd had a lot of infection through the community. We're nowhere near that at the moment. So, again, there's going to be another policy issue on how this is going to be handled in the long term because we were thinking of a peak maybe about April, May, what if it's August or September? We really don't know. We simply don't want to get into the situation that Italy, Spain, Britain and uh, New York City, for instance, are in. That's that's a really interesting context that you, you're giving to of the sorts of questions that, that government is having to consider in, in response to you know how they they start working out what that exit strategy is. Now, uh, Peter, over the weekend, speaking of the work that the Doherty Institute has been doing, there was um, a collaborative study between uh, the Doherty Institute and the Monash Biomedicine Discovery Institute that looked at ivermectin, uh, stopping the virus growing in cell culture. Uh, for those unaware, ivermectin is traditionally used to treat lice and scabies. How encouraging are those early results and what's the next step? Yeah, so well, it's, it's interesting. Ivermectin is a very safe drug. It's been used almost uh, enormously widely. Uh, the Merck company, which produced it, uh, gave it uh, for free 
to get rid of river blindness in the developing world. And, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Campbell uh, won the Nobel Prize for that, uh, shared the Nobel Prize. And um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a great drug. And there's, there's some understanding of possible mode of action so maybe it has some effect. There's an enormous number of compounds out there, actually, that people would like to throw into the mix and get tested. And so there's, a, I think, the, uh, uh, the MRFF, the Medical Research Futures Fund, is uh, people are currently preparing a grant application for that. Um, and uh, so ivermectin may be interesting. Uh, it's a cheap drug. It's very available. It's, um, it was a veterinary drug to start. It was developed for heartworm and dogs. And, uh, and we know a lot about its safety. So, so we'll see where it goes. But, but you've got to realise the, these experiments in uh, tissue culture uh, were about the 500 times the dose that uh, um, we could uh, hope to achieve in the, in, in the patient. But, and that, there was also a discussion about how you might administer it. You know, if it's got to get there through the blood, this isn't predominantly a blood disease or could you put it in an inhaler or what? Whether The question is whether it'll show useful effect in trials. And I suppose, you know, it's encouraging to see all this kind of work going on. But uh, a word of caution then really is, you know, we have to wait these studies and these tests to run their course. Uh, and, and, you know, really people should avoid, uh, you know, trying to take it upon themselves to, to access these sorts of, of medicines. Let the, let the experts carry out their studies and then for, for these things to come online when they're ready. Yes, I think it would be very unwise to start dosing yourself with ivermectin at this stage. And uh, um, it, uh, it, it, we need to wait until we've got some, some objective assessment. Um, it's, some of the things that have been tried early on uh, may be helping, maybe not. I mean, there's been a lot of noise about hydroxychloroquine. I've heard uh, or read things uh, on both sides of that equation. So we have to do proper trials and see, see whether that's working. So, it, you know, the main thing about the Australian response, if we can keep this flattened down and, and keep it slow, a lot of those answers will be in and we may, be, we may have a lot bigger armamentarium to use if we later get severe disease. But um, the, the, that's, it's for the future. But by delaying, we... we uh, we increase our level of safety all the time. And of course, we get better, closer to what will hopefully be an effective vaccine, which would be the way to end this whole thing. Now, we know that the elderly uh, are at the most acute risk, but how troubled are you by the growing number of young people who seem to be succumbing to the virus? Fit young people do succumb, and uh, that's a great concern. Uh, and uh, the greatest concern is the most exposed people the young nurses and doctors who are probably getting very big doses of this stuff if they're in ICU units. One of the discussions that's emerged is that the biggest risk is from perhaps small droplet in about in, uh, inhalation. If the droplet size is down about three micromolar, mi micrometer microns, then maybe it gets down deeper into the lung or something of that sort. And that's the sort of thing you get when you're trying to intubate people and there's a lot of sort of moisture flying around. Your son, Michael, is a clinical neurologist working at a hospital in yeah. Seattle. Have you had a chance to hear from him about the conditions they're facing there? Yes, they, uh, uh, Washington State, uh, we're getting very different responses across the different states. Uh, so what Mike is seeing they're a big hospital. They're the biggest private hospital in Seattle. And they also serve um, Alaska and Montana and Idaho, who don't have uh, medical schools, as a kind of referral, referral center for very difficult cases. But they've set a lot of that aside. They're gradually building up the numbers in the uh, wards. And uh, they expect they may get to the point where their ICU machines are pretty utilised uh, within a week or two. So, the, like all the hospitals, they're geared up to this. Uh, they're gradually building up numbers. I, I saw in the New York Times that the doubling time for cases in Seattle was 11 days. Uh, doubling time in New Orleans is three days. Doubling time through a lot of the American South where they've been very late to put on restrictions or even haven't put them on 
is generally somewhere about five days. Now, back here in Australia, the weather is starting to get cooler. Do we have any further evidence that the virus will survive better in cooler conditions? Gen- generally, flu is worse in the cold cold months, but whether that'll be the same with this one, I don't know. And we've got so many other things we've added into the mix, uh, social distancing and so forth. I mean, we might expect a very mild flu season this year if we're all uh, distancing all the time. That should re- reduce the rate of admissions and so forth. And certainly the hospitals are seeing a great drop in general medical admissions for things like respiratory infections, I think, because uh, people are keeping apart. And we're being encouraged, to, since you mentioned flu, to uh, get vaccinated early. Why is that important? Well, you, you don't want to get one and then get the other because both of them are targeting the lung. And if you're getting lung damage, you don't want to have lung damage from COVID-19 and then, then from flu or the other way around. Um, there's no objective evidence. It's just that basically the perception is you don't want to get both these things. So get the flu shot because that's available and get that out of the way. So um, so I've had, I'm, I'm still waiting to get the geriatric flu shot, the one that's given to older people, which is much stronger. Because one of the problems is, and of course, one of the reasons that older people are in more trouble with COVID-19 is older people don't make such good immune responses either to infections or to vaccines. Right. And on Twitter, we've uh, got a question uh, from uh, Tanzel, who's asked us, once someone's recovered from COVID-19, will that person be immune forever? Do we know that the answer to that question? We we don't know the question about forever because we've only known about the virus uh, for a few months. Um, My perception is they'd be immune for a considerable time, but... um, I don't know about about forever. We do know with a, with the influenza virus of 1918, that terrible pandemic, we think that some people were still protected uh, when that uh, a similar virus came along uh, more than 50 years later. So it can last a very long time. But we don't know that's true for COVID-19. We also know that some of the respiratory viruses of children um, respiratory syncytial virus, para-influenza viruses, that we all would have caught as children because everyone does and every child still catches, uh, particularly the para-flus because there's no vaccine, they can be problematic in the elderly because uh, grandchildren, for instance, can reinfect them. Mm. So, so we don't really know. It's specific to the virus. I would think that people would be, be pretty protected for, for a few years Uh, unless the virus changes and it's not changing particularly fast in a way that would be problematic. So so, uh, though we don't know, I I think personally that after this year, if we can get people vaccinated, even if COVID-19 sticks around, it'll be no enormous problem for us. Well, Peter, some encouraging signs on various fronts today. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, pleasure to talk, Paul. And I'll be back on Wednesday with special guest Dr Asha Bowen from the Telethon Kids Institute in Western Australia. I'm Paul Richards. See you then.